Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the State of Dallas podcast, a part of the Dave Campbell's family, the Republic of Football Podcast Network. Give us a subscribe, follow us wherever you catch your podcast at. Check us out, the Republic of Football Podcast, delivering all of the colleges in Texas to you through the podcast format. So SMU was on a buy last week, so not too much to review Overall, as SMU gets ready for a 6.30 p.m. Central Time kickoff on ESPN against East Carolina. So as we jump into this podcast, guys, this is an SMU team that sits at 3-2 and two overall. They sit at 1-0 and oh in the AAC after their win over Charlotte going into the bye week. And now they get an opportunity to go on the road and find their first road win of the season. They've gone to Oklahoma, they've gone to TCU, and they've come up without a win so far on the road. So this is a big moment for this team, even if East Carolina is sitting at 1-4 and four overall on this season. This is an East Carolina team that is battle-tested. They've played Michigan. They've played Marshall. They've played a couple other teams, including Rice, which was their latest game, that they have now you know, rightfully been Battle tested. And so the record could be a little deceiving in this one for the Pirates. And let me tell you, this is a Thursday night crowd that will be rowdy. They're a program that is a tough place to go and play and come away with a win. Um, SMU found this out a couple of years ago. They went up there. SMU was rolling. East Carolina was not. And it was 45 to 7 at the half. There's a couple of players, uh, quite a few actually, I would say that are still on the SMU roster from that game. And so they'll have that in the back of their minds. This isn't a team that will go to East Carolina and underestimate this Mike Houston team. He's a really good coach. He's been able to assemble some good teams in the past for East Carolina, but they're breaking in a new quarterback or quarterbacks, I should say, as Alex Flynn and Mason Garcia have been the two that they've played They've combined to just throw two touchdowns to seven interceptions. They haven't gotten much going in the passing game. The run game, they've got some options. They've got Rahaje Harris. They've got Mason Garcia and Alex Flynn, um, both of who, uh, especially Mason Garcia, can kind of tuck it and run. Um, but for the most part, they look to pass when they drop back. Um, Mason Garcia is the one that uh, they've been able to find some success on the ground. He's got 177 yards on the season. And Javius Bond is another one with 187 yards, averaging 6.7 yards per carry, uh, as well as a touchdown already um, on his resume. He's a young one for East Carolina that's broken out and had a good game against Rice. Uh, they came up short. And, and quite honestly, talking with a lot of East Carolina people this week, this is a team that for them is frustrating to watch. Anytime you break in a new quarterback um, or, or like like I said earlier, in their case, two quarterbacks, there are some growing pains. And East Carolina is a proud program. They've been able to field some good teams throughout their time um, under Mike Houston and teams that are tough, teams that you know make you play your best to beat them. Um, SMU's been involved in, obviously, that one in East Carolina, which was uh, heavily, heavily tilted uh, to East Carolina's favor. But they've also been involved with some fun games in Dallas, 59-51. Um, was one, uh, I think, in 2021, uh, the last game uh, in Dallas. I'll have to double check that as we roll here. But um, SMU has been able to, um, you know, have mix, a mixed bag uh, of success against East Carolina. And so as you look at this game, and I talked about it before the season, I felt like this game, I felt like the Memphis game were two difficult matchups for SMU on the road. When I looked at their schedule, I felt like these were the two games that would pose the biggest difficulty going into it. And the reason is, is one, you've got East Carolina that has this record at home throughout kind of the history of playing SMU where they've been tough to play against. And, of course, Memphis just being a thorn in SMU's side um, in the Liberty Bowl. SMU hasn't won there in a decade. But I've identified those two games. SMU now comes off a of bye week. East Carolina does as well. And both teams could come out in two different ways. You know, East Carolina could show that they truly are a one in four team. Uh, they're, they're a defensive football team. They're averaging, giving up 21 points per game this season. 
On the flip side, talking with people uh, in Greenville this week, it is a poor, poor offense. And that is something where Vegas has the line right now, I think at 12 and a half, the over-under set at about 51 and a half. This is one of those games where East Carolina's defense is going to force SMU's offense to earn just about every single yard that they you know, get on, on Thursday um, in this one. But on the same side of things, SMU's defense – much improved. One of the most improved defenses in the country overall, um, probably a top five defense in terms of overall improvement, which is worth noting because this East Carolina offense has struggled for the most part. They ha- they really haven't had much success overall this season. And so if SMU can jump all over them and go down the field and score a touchdown on their opening drive, that would be a really, really good sign for how this game is going to go because This defense has shown me that they can be trusted to play anyone on SMU's schedule and keep SMU in this in the game, whether it's Oklahoma, whether it's TCU, Louisiana Tech, Charlotte. This is a defense that has played really, really, really well so far this season. And so I lean on SMU's defense here. You know, when you go on the road and you go into an insane environment, they're going to have the night at the Boneyard. They're wearing their black jerseys. They're going to be fired up. How do you combat that? Hitting, playing good defense, capitalizing on your red zone opportunities. And, you know, when you look at the keys to this game and not to jump too into that early on uh, as we kind of break this one down, but both teams have kind of struggled in the red zone. SMU has a good hit rate as far as coming away with points in the red zone, but East Carolina has truly struggled in the red zone. They, 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 just don't do well when they get down in that area of the field. But when you go on the road and you play a proud football team and Mike Houston, you know, he's one of the underrated coaches. He hasn't reached that pinnacle of high success at East Carolina. But when you play a team that is coached by him and they're going to force you to earn everything, you've got to come away with a touchdown. You've got to come away with something early that takes this crowd out of the game. And in talking with Preston Stone early this week, I felt like Preston going into this week, his confidence in his press conference and media availability was through the roof. He kind of, I felt like, indirectly stuck up for his offense. He talked about how these guys come to work every day, how they really bring everything they can and they pour all that they can into what SMU does day in, day out. He was talking about how People don't understand what goes on in these guys' lives behind closed doors. And he was talking about other players on the team, in my opinion, at least, and how they still come into the football operations building. They come to the practice field. They come to the Armstrong Fieldhouse, and they just get after it and go to work. And I think that's important as we look ahead to this seven-game stretch is that has this offense been what everybody kind of thought it? could be with Preston Stone at the helm. Is it as explosive as we thought it might be? No. They've got a strong run game. The offensive line has been excellent. But this season, they haven't been that top 10 offense that we've seen in the past when it comes to SMU football and what they've been able to do. And they relied on this offensive line, who, by the way, is going to get Justin Osborne, the starting right guard, back um, based on what Rhett Lashley said this week. They're going to get a key piece to their offensive line back And I think that's important because as you get into league play and deeper into it, SMU is a team that hasn't hit on all cylinders offensively. It's been carried by the defense. It's been carried by that defensive line. But as you get deeper into it, you've got to be able to turn that corner offensively. And East Carolina, like I said earlier, giving up 21 points per game it's a defense that is pretty well well coached. They're fundamentally sound. They play extremely hard. They do have athletes uh, that stack up pretty well. And for SMU, the offense has to find ways to get playmakers involved and at a high level. That's something that the wide receiver group that they have in Dallas has not been able to do at a fairly consistent clip this season. It's been a lot of, we're going to run the football, the offensive line is going to give Preston Stone plenty of time to go through his progressions. He's going to be able to find what he needs in the passing game, particularly in the intermediate passing game, to move the chains. 
It hasn't been consistent. It hasn't been perfect. But that's kind of been their their game plan so far this season. And I, I feel like as you get into conference play, one thing SMU hasn't been really known for is running the football. They've had these playmakers. They've had all these wide receivers that have come through. And they do have talent. You know, they don't have guys that are liabilities out there at wide receiver. They've got upside guys. And so what we're waiting on is for it to click, is for it to come together where the offensive passing game complements that running game so well. And we don't know if Kamar Wheaton is going to be able to go. He tweaked a hamstring before Charlotte. We don't know how well LJ Johnson is going to do in his first action back this season since getting nicked up early against uh, Prairie View A&M. We just don't know. And so as you look at the running back room, you look at Jalen Knighton, what he was able to do against Charlotte. He showed his explosiveness. He showed that ability to hit the hole, the hole and go for a long run, the 95-yard touchdown run. We saw Velton Gardner, one of their backups, you know, really impressed. Tyler Levine over the last few games has gotten in there and done what he's capable of doing, which is picking up chunks of yardage and doing it in a physical manner. So if that run game is consistently producing the passing game, Jordan Curley, Jake Bailey, Romello Brinson, Keyshawn Smith, Mucci Dixon, Jordan Hudson, all of those guys, RJ Maryland, the tight end, all have to get involved and all have to step up to be true playmakers. And Preston Stone has to continue to get better at going through his reads and, and delivering the football on time. That's something where at times, it seems like Preston's been a little late throwing the football here and there, but that's where SMU can turn the corner at. You come off a of bye week, you get down to self-scouting, seeing what you do well, seeing where you can improve, and I think that's probably where they spent the majority of their time in the last week, talking with Preston Stone, saying, hey, what works for you? What do you like to do overall in our passing game? And what's worked well? Let's look at that. Let's try to not simplify things because it doesn't seem like it needs to be simplified from a passing concepts perspective. Rhett Lashley's offense has shown over the years that it can produce in the passing game when it's been you know, timed up well, when it's been um, executed well. I don't think it's necessarily a scheme thing. I think one thing we've we've seen um, SMU been able to do is simplify some of their window dressing, some of those things that Rhett Lashley likes to do with reverses and jet sweeps and even a flea flicker against Oklahoma. Those things we've not seen as much in the last couple games, and I think that's a good thing. That's that's a good tweak to their overall plan because SMU does have talent. They do have players that can make plays when called upon. You just have to put them in those positions to do that. And where the players have to hold up their end of the bargain is catching the football when it's delivered on time, is making the right read and delivering it on time if you're pressing stone. Those things have just been a step behind here and there. So I'm looking forward to seeing how SMU does this week in the passing game. It's one of the biggest pieces coming off the bye week that if you're an SMU fan, if you're covering SMU, you expect improvement you expect them to take that next step because you know what you have in the run game they can do it they can absolutely run the football on just about anyone you know there there's been a various level of hit rate but for the most part the run game has come together a lot earlier than it did last season it's been productive a lot more so than it was last season which is a good thing for this SMU offense defensively SMU could very well be without Brandon Crosley they're starting nickel um, the depth chart was released this week, and it looks like there's a chance that he's not going to play. Rhett Lashley called him a game-time decision, but he wasn't on the depth chart. And so for whatever reason, that change was made, whereas Justin Osborne's been the starting right guard on the depth chart over the past couple of weeks. It looks like C.J. Sanders, who grabbed an interception against Charlotte, is going to get the start. And I look at the secondary, and they've benefited in a big way from having this defensive line step up for them. This defensive line has you know, been a group that between the starting, let's call it four true rot rotational guys with Jordan Miller, the big nose tackle, who's been awesome, uh, Devere Levelston, Elijah Chapman, 
Elijah Roberts, those guys along the interior of that defensive line have been excellent. They've allowed this secondary to play a little bit more aggressive. And then Nelson Paul and Isaiah Smith and Jalen Samuels, those are guys that have done a really nice job this season to try and disrupt the passing game. Sometimes they've overrun things like we saw against TCU. They had opportunities to get Chandler Morris down and they did not. But this week, they're facing more of a true traditional pass game. Um, and, and quite honestly, East Carolina, they like to hand the football off kind of up the middle. Very, I mean, just talking with East Carolina people and get people that cover the, uh, the team, very kind of predictable. You know, they, they don't push the ball down the field. They don't do a lot of elaborate things offensively. And so defensively for SMU, this is a game where Scott Simons has to be feeling really good. I think their base defense and what they do has been really strong this season. And whoever's been playing at linebacker has been good to just solid. It hasn't been an over-the-top linebacker play where you see guys take over games. We've seen Ahmad Walker step up. We've seen Kobe Wilson step up. Alex Kilgore has gotten some good burn. Um, they've been able to rotate that group, and I think they're perfectly content with that because they have the defensive line. They have the secondary that is filled with depth and talent that can push them, again, kind of over that top. That's why they're, I believe, top 30 in total defense. That's why they're very clearly one of the most improved defenses in the country. They rank among all the top defenses in the AAC overall in multiple categories. I believe they're top three in probably seven categories, things like third down defense, things like total total yardage, points per game, all of those things. So defensively for SMU, things are on the up and up. And I, I think when you look at the bye week and what you want to see them improve upon is as a defensive line, they've done a really nice job controlling the line of scrimmage. And that's something that in year one, they didn't have. They didn't have the true nose tackle. They didn't have the depth. Even a guy like Corey Roberson, uh, who stepped up a transfer from Oklahoma, they haven't had those guys that have taken that to the next level until this year. And that has allowed there to be this higher expectation for this group, not only going into the season, but now that SMU's five games in, you expect this defense to be ready to go week in, week out. And coming off a of bye, they got an opportunity to clean things up. And what I mean by clean things up is there are moments throughout the season. And again, this is kind of one of those things where you've got to watch this team play defensively because, yes, there are moments that they don't do what they're supposed to. They don't fit their gaps the right way. They over pursue or they miss a tackle. And all of those things are made to be a little bit more, um, I think the right word is probably pronounced because they're playing at such a high level. So when they don't force a three and out or a six and out, you know, they don't limit offenses to, uh, you know, little production and they let a big play get broken on them or they, allow a team to get some momentum on a drive, those are, again, pronounced because they've been playing such good football. And they've played two power five teams, so to speak. And this is an SMU roster that was built for the AAC. They were not constructed with the idea that the ACC was already happening. And, you know, that's the reality of it. So that's a different discussion for another day as they prepare for next season in the ACC. But when you look at what they've been able to do, they have to play with consistency. And I think this defensive staff being here um, for a second year and outside of the change at the linebackers coach with Maurice Crum coming in, they're all back. This is not a group that, that, that really struggles to play at, at a high level consistently. and. The issues have come when they've tried to rotate too much. And I think we're seeing some clarity. And when I look at that secondary, you have Charles Woods, you have Chris Meganson, guys that they really feel good about overall in coverage, supporting the run game, all of those things. 
And when you look at what they have at the safety position, I think they're they're finding out who their real contributors are at that safety position because you have Jonathan McGill, who's been all over the place. I think he's either first or second on the team in tackles, um, which is which is tr- tremendous. But we've seen an emergence of Isaiah Wacobia, a Dallas skyline product who, you know, at one point it looked like he was going to transfer. At one point it looked like he was falling down the depth chart. Instead, what did he do? He put together a ridiculous offseason. He got the Jerry Levias jersey, number 23, which is a huge honor at SMU. And now he's your starting safety over Brian Massey, at least according to the depth chart. And he's been playing that much too. He's been much improved as a tackler. Um, He has been what you kind of expected when they signed him out of Dallas skyline. A lot of power five programs back at that moment were gunning for him, trying to get him uh, to flip away from SMU. But instead he ends up sticking with the Mustangs. And so it's been an interesting road for him, but instead of letting at this point, Brian Massey continue to miss tackles, continue to, he's a boomer bust player. He's either making a massive play or he's missing a tackle and it's, a, and it's going for a big play. And that is something that SMU has done a really good job of much earlier this season is rewarding play that is truly maybe a step up or cut above the other players in that defense. And, you know, the offense, they're rotating receivers left and right. There isn't a receiver that has really stepped up. You know, Jake Bailey's been very good. Mucci Dixon's been reliable. But you haven't seen that game breaker, that you know, first round type of draft pick, the second round dra- draft pick like Rasheed Rice was emerge. In the secondary, last year we saw Ahmad Moses get his opportunity late in the season because he had continued to work and continued to progress. Now he's playing a lot of football for SMU and a key contributor. They're not waiting around to find out if Isaiah Wachovia can be that guy. They've thrown him in there. They've given him opportunities. He had a good offseason. And you know what? If Brian Massey can't do it, they're going to lean on him a little bit more, um, and that being Isaiah Wachovia. So I like the buttons SMU's press defensively uh, in this one uh, or in this season, and it's paid off. They've, they've been much improved. They've been able to really step up. Um, so for SMU uh, to go to East Carolina and win, a couple keys for me. Offensively, I think the first possession, they absolutely have to score a touchdown. When they've gone to Oklahoma, when they've gone to TCU, They've either not scored um, or they've they've come away with a field goal. East Carolina is obviously not OU, not TCU, but it is going to be a rowdy environment on ESPN Thursday night. They've got a bunch of giveaways. The student section is going to be packed. The stadium is, for the most part, always filled in East Carolina. That's what they do in Greenville. They go support their Pirates. Take the crowd out of the game. Go down the field, score a touchdown by any means necessary. And I'm perfectly okay. I want to say this right now, perfectly okay. If Rhett Lashley goes for a fourth down when they get on that side of the field and kind of plays a little bit more aggressive, you're not going to hear me saying, well, you should have taken the points. You're on the road. We've seen how that plays out even against a one and four football team. I'd like to see them be a little bit more aggressive on the road, show that mindset to their team that look, SMU's defense, we believe in you. We're going to go for this on fourth down. And whatever happens, happens. Not saying that that is going to happen, that they're going to have to go for it on fourth down. But they do have the ability to do that because that defense is playing at a high level. So I'd like to see a little bit more aggressiveness when it comes to those situations early. Try to uh, stamp your, your brand, your name on this game early on. Because, again, if you let this East Carolina team hang around, they're going to make a game of it. They did that against Rice. They've played some decent football here and there. It hasn't been consistently by any means, but they're battle tested. And that's why I don't think they're going to care at all that SMU is coming in three and two, which isn't anything to really. And Rhett Lashley said it this week. It isn't anything to really like puff your chest out about. They have to play well to win. But when you're SMU going into this raucous environment, make a statement early and make a statement that you're going to be the class of the AAC. And if that involves going for it on fourth down early on, not going to complain about that, even if they miss it. I think they have the opportunity to go in and make a statement. SMU under Rhett Lashley, and one thing, it's only been a year and five games, but they've kind of 
in league play been able to kind of go on a little bit of a revenge tour. They went to Tulsa and won for the first time in a while. Uh, they beat Houston and sent them on their way in the Big 12. They just kind of found a way to get some wins that teams that SMU teams in the past have not. This is one of those games where SMU is expected to be right there in, in late November for the AAC championship game appearance. If that's the type of team you're putting together, go out there, make a statement, score an early touchdown, take the crowd out of the game because you know defensively you have the opportunity to play really well. And on the defensive side of the ball, SMU did get, get a turnover. C.J. Sanders intercepted a pass against Charlotte at the end of it um, when uh, Trexler Ivy was in at quarterback, kind of their more passing quarterback uh, for Charlotte. And I think that's something that maybe they can build off of. Again, these inter these quarterbacks have thrown seven interceptions uh, over the course of five games for East Carolina. And so that's really important to kind of note. They're susceptible to throwing interceptions. For SMU, take advantage of those opportunities. Try to rip the ball out, force a, force a fumble, grab an interception when you've got that opportunity. Those are ways to get off the field, obviously, quicker, but really kick that momentum in your corner and ride it to a win. So... I, I say all this that SMU can be the class of the AAC. I say all this that their defense is much improved. I still see this as a tough game. But I think SMU is going to win 31. I think I, I think I'd, on the PonyExpress.com, I, I picked 17. 31-17. So a 14-point cover on the road is what I predicted. That would be perfectly fine with me. Go into Greenville. Get a win. You should be able to control the game. Overall, with your athletes, with your run game, with your defense, go in there, grab a win. I think one of those scores for East Carolina in my prediction would be a late one, um, something where SMU's up 34 to 10 in the waning minutes, and, and they kind of make it a little bit you know, more respectable um, in a sense. I think SMU has the talent to truly control this game. What I would like to see is I'd like to see SMU go in and, and really beat up on East Carolina. This is a team that's down. They're, they're coming off a bye, which you can kind of build some momentum around that. But this is an opportunity for SMU to really beat up on a conference team and do it in their own backyard on a nationally televised game. That's something that as you know, somebody who's covered SMU for a decade now, it's those, those opportunities and capitalizing on those opportunities are kind of few and far between. Uh, somebody was texting me this week and said, man, Vegas moving that line from nine and a half to 12 and a half feels a little sketchy. I kind of agreed with them. I'm still picking SMU to, to win 31-17. Um, but again, I think this is an offense that is still progressing. It's tough for me to really get behind them in terms of point production. But this is an East Carolina team that SMU should be able to control and move past, improve the 2-0, and and then you go on the road against Temple in a Friday night game, and you get kind of a similar opportunity. Another team that's not very good, you get an opportunity to go on the road and grab another road win before you host Tulsa for homecoming. So a big game for SMU. It is not one that despite three and two versus one and four, you look at and you say, this should be a blowout. It's it's one of those where on ESPN, the blackout in, in East Carolina, maybe hold on to your butts a little bit, but if SMU fans – uh, see a blowout, uh, you've got to give a lot of credit to this staff because that would be a big statement regardless of that record for East Carolina. So with that, guys, we didn't have a game to review. We are going to um, shut this one down, just kind of a preview of the game. We'll be back next week on the State of Dallas podcast with a full reaction to SMU's game against East Carolina and also preview that Friday night matchup against Temple. So Thank you to Dave Campbells for having us a part of this network. You can subscribe to the Dave Campbells YouTube channel, Spotify, Apple, wherever you catch the Republic of Football podcast. We'll be back next week with another edition. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend.